Okay, this is an interview with uh, Seymour Segan uh, at the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center, Saratoga Springs, New York. It's November 21st, 2002, approximately 9 a.m. The interviewer is Michael Russert. Could you tell me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Seymour Segan, and uh, my date of birth was December the 5th, 1922, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, 106 Christopher Street. Okay, what was your pre-war education? I went to Thomas Jefferson High School, I graduated from there, uh, January 1940, and uh, if you remember your history, we were still in the Depression. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to work, and uh, went to uh, Brooklyn College at night. Uh, when December 7th came around, 1941, as a matter of fact, I was an assistant scoutmaster at the time. Could you tell me what you remember about that day? What, I remember that, I remember that day very well because I had a, a troop of Boy Scouts, uh, kids from 11 to 13 years old. We were in Coitsville, New Jersey, which is right across from the George Washington Bridge. In those days, it was still woods, and today it's all built up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would get off near the George Washington Bridge, walk across, and about a mile and a half, two miles, near Alpine, New Jersey. We would walk into the woods, set up a camp, and uh, I remember in a uh, forest ranger coming into the where we were camped, and saying that Pearl Harbor, that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, these kids were only 11, 12, 13, and they all started to say, hey, whoopee, we're at war. And I remember sitting down, having them all sit down, and say, now look, war is not fun. You're gonna, your fathers, your brothers, your uncles, will all have to go in and fight it. I says, I'll be going in. I didn't think I re reached them at that time. But later on in the day, when we walked back across the George Washington Bridge, they already posted armed soldiers with fixed bayonets. And I think the message got to them then. And it was a very quiet group going back on the subway to Brooklyn. Uh, I wanted to go in right away. Mm -hmm. Did you enlist? Or were you I uh, enlisted, but I couldn't enlist at that time because my mother and father wouldn't sign for me and I was at too young to go in under my own. I had made application in January for the Aviation Cadet Program and my parents would not sign for me. We had a little fight and we finally I convinced them that if I didn't enlist I'd be drafted and I want my branch of service, I want there to be a cadet. And they agreed, once I, the, my age group came up for, registered for the draft, they'd allow me to enlist. Why did you pick the Army Air Corps? I was young. Uh, flying was an exciting thing. I remember as a kid going down to Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and watching the flying. Never went up, but I was able to watch it. At that time, uh, One of the first casualties, one of the first uh, heroes of World War II was a pilot by the name of Colin Kelly. I don't know if you're familiar with that story. And uh, his bombardier was my 11, a Jewish fellow. I'm Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I felt I could do the most by being a bombardier. And that was my goal. And, uh, when I went in, finally, in October, uh, October the 5th, I believe it was, I went to Camp Upton, and then I was shipped to Mitchell Field. And I was doing KP and God duty, waiting for my aviation school to open up for me. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was so good at the kitchen, I always was good in the kitchen. That I was off, I was a dear dining room orderly. I used to make the salads and desserts mm -hmm. and things like that. And I was mess officer 
wanted to send me to uh, Cooks and Bakers School to become a cook. He says, hey, you'll be stationed right near home. I said, no way, I'm going to be a cadet. And we shipped out after a while and I ended up in uh, Houston, Texas pre-flight school. Where, uh, my cadet program started. And there I went to uh, gunnery school at Laredo, Texas. And to Midland, Texas, that's where our present president from Midland. And uh, that was advanced bombardier training and became a bombardier, second lieutenant. Uh, had a lay en route to Salt Lake City where we were, our crew was organized, pilot, co pilot, and what navigator. What kind of planes did you train in? We trained in an AT 11. It's a twin tail plane, uh, ideal for bombing runs. And uh, uh, we would, uh, if you hit the target, you had a shack. Uh, that would be the bullseye. We dropped 100 pound bombs with five pounds of black powder so it would show the puff of smoke. And we, we were two, we were a team of two, while one uh, cadet would be bomb on the bombing run, the other would be photographing, and then to take turns, the photographer became the bombardier, and the previous bombardier became the photographer. Uh, we had good training. Uh, we had uh, many training missions. You can train for what you have to do, but you can't train for combat. And, uh, the only way you train for combat is to be in combat. And uh, we were a whole, a whole group. We were training as the 485th and the States. We were, went over as a group. We went over individually, but we went over as a group. We did have one terrible calamity, not my squadron. The eight, I was in the 829th of the 485th. But the uh, ground crew of the 831st was on a Liberty ship that was sunk, and it was one of the worst Liberty ship casualties. Six hundred and some odd men died on that ship, and uh, the ground crew of that uh, squadron was wiped out. No, nobody was, everybody was lost on that. Uh, uh, Nazis bombed the uh, Liberty ship, the convoy, in the Mediterranean. Uh, on the way over, we did lose one crew, Lieutenant Olney's crew, in Morocco hit the Atlas Mountains and they were all killed, uh, including the two dogs that were on board with them, uh, mascots. Uh, we went down to South America and across to Dakar and uh, Africa and then up the coast to Marrakech and Marrakech to Tunis. And uh, we uh, trained additionally in North Africa. And from North Africa we flew to Italy, where a small town called Venosa wasn't far from Spinoza, north of Barry. Barry was about 70, 80 miles south of us. Uh, there were groups all over southern Italy at that time. That was prior to the breakthrough to Rome. And uh, actually our group was involved in the breakthrough of Rome. What, what uh, bomber squadron and uh, group were you in? I would, the group was the 485th Bomb Group and my squadron was the 829th. There were 18 planes in each squadron and there were four squadrons in the group. Our commanding officer was a, quite a famous one, uh, Arnold, Colonel Arnold, whose uncle was Hap Arnold, mm -hmm. who was the head of the Air Force at that time. Mm -hmm. He uh, got shot down after I got shot down later on. He was in one of those forced marches from the German prison camps when they were retreating. Uh, he recently died about uh, a little over a year ago. He was very much loved by the men, uh, even after the war. And what type of plane did you fly? It was a B-24 Liberator, four engine. Mm -hmm. uh, had about an 8,000 bomb capacity, 8,000 pound bomb capacity. Uh, we very rarely carried 8,000, five to 6,000 was common. Mm -hmm. Also, at times we carried incendiaries, which was a lot lighter. Mm -hmm. Did your crew stay together? We stayed together. Mm -hmm. 
Did you? And uh, uh, seven died together. Mm -hmm. uh, out of the ten, seven died. Six are in one grave in uh, Fort McPherson in Maxwell, Nebraska. It's a special cemetery for group burials. I believe I sent you a picture of yes, the, tomb, of, yes, the of the uh, yes. grave um, marker. Did you have a name for your plane? Tyers Flyers, T-Y-E-R-S Flyers. Our pilot's name was Tyre, Ivan Tyre. So we called ourselves Tyers Flyers. Did you decorate the nose? Uh, no. We didn't have a decoration. Your jackets, did you have decorated jackets no. at all? No. no. Okay. Uh, we did not get shot down in our own plane. Our plane was shot up from the last mission we were on, and they were going to hit the oil refineries, part of the Ploesti group, mm -hmm. oil refinery. And uh, they wanted to have maximum strength, so they sent us up with a plane from the 831st called Nudis K. That had no thought. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there were three Nudis Ks. Uh, we were the first. It was not our plane. I found out afterwards it should not have been flying. It was in worse shape than our plane was, which we didn't fly. What had happened to your plane? Our plane later on got shot down off the coast. Well, uh, originally, why well, couldn't you fly it on this mission? Because the previous mission we were on, it was pretty badly shot up and it mm -hmm. had to be repaired. Mm -hmm. uh, flak draw tear some big holes. <laughs> uh, you most likely have interviewed other fellows that tell you about these big yes. black puffs of smoke that yeah. look so harmless, but when they hit you, boy. And uh, we were pretty badly hit, and it wasn't enough to shoot us down, but enough to make it uh, not worthy of flying until it was repaired. Uh, I found out later on that the plane, after being repaired, somebody else did get to fly it, a replacement crew. And they got shot down, I believe it was in, I forget the, when it was, because it was after I got mm -hmm. shot down. Uh, they were bombing submarine pens in uh, the southeastern part of France. And they got shot down. Uh, Nudis K was, in, was not uh, ready for flight. It, was, it, shouldn't, it should have been grounded. And uh, that was one of the reasons why we got shut down. We couldn't keep up with the group. We lost the number three engine and wasn't flying right. And was this it, from flak or was this just from... No, this flat? was from not being a perfect plane and then later on the flak hurt us and then we were hit by uh, ME 109s. We couldn't keep up with the group. The greatest strength that you have as a uh, bomb, in a bomb group is the power of the group. Mm -hmm. uh, each B-24 had ten guns. You had a nose turret in the front with two 50 caliber machine guns. I don't know if you're aware what a 50 caliber, pretty big bullet. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a top turret gunner. You had a uh, ball turret gunner, each one having two 50 caliber machine guns. And then in the waist, there was, on each waist window would be one 50 caliber machine gun. And then you had a tail gunner with two 50 caliber machine guns. That's a total of 10 uh, 50 caliber machine guns in each ship. Mm -hmm. If you're flying in a box of six and another box of six and you have 18 where your group flies, we fly so close that sometimes the wing of the plane alongside of us, would you could, you could feel like you could almost go out and touch it. You could see the pilot and co-pilot in the cockpit. That's how close we'd fly. Mm -hmm. The closer you could fly together without hitting each other was your strength. You had the strength of all these 50 caliber machine guns zoning in on one or two or three ME-109s or FW-190s. Uh, most of the time, the targets which were far away, your fighter escort could not go all the way with you. And if they did go all the way with you, they were carrying uh, uh, belly tanks for extra gas. The minute they were attacked, they had to drop the belly tanks because they were cumbersome and they could not maneuver in a dogfight. So they would take us out and then they would meet us as we were coming back. But uh, when you usually turned off the target, and the target would always be uh, very heavily uh, saturated with flak. They'd send up box barrages of flak. Uh, when you came off, made your quick turn off the target after you dropped your bombs, the fighters would be waiting for you. 
and uh, that was a dangerous period. When we turned, we couldn't keep up our airspeed, so we couldn't turn as fast with the group, and the group kept going. They don't wait for stragglers, and we were left alone. And the fighter escort hadn't caught up with us as yet, the return fighter escort. Uh, toward the middle of my tour, my missions, uh, the P-51 became prevalent, and that was a much better plane. Prior to that, we had P-47s and P-38s, and they were not as good as the P-51. P-51 was a superior fighter at that time. Mm -hmm. Today, it's museum quality. Uh, we turned off the target. We lost the number three engine. We were having a problem with the other engines. Couldn't keep up with the group. We were attacked by... I have different... Uh, in the group's recitation of the mission, they say, I think, seven ME-109s attacked us. In uh, the uh, interviews after the mission, when you go back, the fellows who came back, I read some of their reports, they're as high as nine. I know there was a lot of ME-109s there. And uh, they were 20 millimeters they carried in the machine guns. And uh, we were down to about 13,000 feet. Uh, the navigator, Milton Hirsch, saw fire in the Bombay. Our intercom was out. And uh, I didn't see the fire. I was up in the in the Bombardier compartment is a big plexiglass bubble that you could look around. And my job when I wasn't bombing was to call out the directions of the fighters that they'd be coming in, two at three o'clock, one at two, you know, that type of thing. So the gunners could be ready for them and swing their guns. Uh, he saw the fire and he just bailed out the Bombay. Uh, he couldn't notify anybody unless he went, you know, and he knew he was in trouble. Uh, the pilot at first dropped his landing gear. Uh, that was a signal that they surrendered. But previously, a lot of fellows did some bad things in our Air Force. They would drop the landing gear, a sign of surrender. The ME-109s or the FWs would come alongside and ask, escort you to a, a German airfield. and. Then, one or two cases, they shot down the ME-109s. They were sitting ducks. So they no longer acknowledged surrender. Uh, it was a little scary for me because when they dropped the landing gear, the nose wheel goes down and that was my escape hatch. And with the nose wheel down, I can't get out. But just before I went into a dive, he pulled the, the wheels up because they were still coming at us. And then he gave me the... Uh, Alarm to bail out. I was just about to go out the nose wheel, and I estimated somewhere that according to what the reports of the planes when they gave their briefing. After you have a mission, you have to go in for a briefing, and you go through whatever happened with the planes that got shot down, how many shoots you saw, uh, how many planes were, were uh, fighters were attacking. Uh, we estimate to be about 13,000 feet, uh, based on the reports of other planes, the planes that came back. We uh, went into a straight dive, straight down to the ground. And I was just about to bail out when the force of the dive pushed me back and I held on. And of course the thought came, I gotta get out, I gotta get out. Uh, I can't, it'll be quick, I won't feel it. Uh, no, I don't want to die. Okay. You want to turn the camera off for a minute? Pardon? You want to turn the camera off for a minute? No. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. I'm going to be 80 next week. You get it? You get a little emotional, mm -hmm. can't I? Do a glass of water here, please. No, it's all right. Okay. Uh, 
and I'm fighting to get out the whole way, and all of a sudden I get out, and I see the plane go by me, and you're trained to wait so your chute will not foul mm -hmm. up with the pain, but all of a sudden the chute opens up, and I still to this day don't know how that chute opened up. Uh, if I pulled it, I don't remember pulling it. If it hit something that pulled the ripcord, I don't know. And I look up, and there's the chute. And I look down, and there's the plane smeared all over the ground. The estimate is I got out about 300 feet before it hit the ground, just seconds. Uh, I start to climb my chute out of panic. I'm going into the flames of the plane. I hit the ground. Oh, is that what? Who's that, Eisenhower there? No. Well, whoever picture that is, I'm about as, maybe the curtains or that picture is where I am from mm -hmm. the plane. I could feel the heat of the fire and everything. It melted my May West. It didn't melt it, but it made it all, mm -hmm. the, the color came so out. So about 10 or 15 yards? I would say I was about 50 to 75 feet away from mm -hmm. the uh, plane. You could, all you heard was the, 50 caliber machine gun bullets going off in the, in the fire. And uh, I didn't know at that time, I found on the ground, now all of a sudden I see part of the plane floating down. On the way, in the dive from 13,000 feet to the ground, it blew, and the whole rear end of the plane from the, uh, oh, I'd say the, uh, where the ball turret gun is back, a little before the ball turret gun. Uh, it saved the radio operator's life. He was in the waist, manning the waist gun, and uh, holding on to the gun because the dive was just pushing him to the nose. And uh, it blew him out the waist window. It did break his hand, whereas mm -hmm. he was holding on to the gun. And we think that was at about four or 5,000 feet in that area, we don't know for sure. Uh, the only other body that they did recover part, they only, only found 35 pounds out of 200, was Peterson's body. And they did find one dog tag. And he's buried in Belgium. And the report, the grave report said, uh, uh, were fingerprints taken? No. Why not? No hands. And they have a skeleton type of thing. I don't know if I sent you that one, because that's a little gruesome. Uh, it shows blacked out parts of what they didn't find. Yes. Uh, he's buried in Belgium. They, he never came back to the States. Uh, yeah. And he was a waste gunner too, so I have a feeling that he, he might have been blown out, but blown out to the point where he had killed him. Because they did find his, his body was not in the flames. He was, mm -hmm. the Romanian peasants told me there was a, one of my comrades was, lying there. Uh, I'm on the ground, but when I hit the ground, I hit it so hard because climbing the chute didn't help, and also I got out very low to the ground, mm -hmm. and I smashed my left leg. And uh, it was in a farm field, you know, hanging over a furrow, you know, plowed, plowed furrow. And all of a sudden I see a chute coming down, and uh, wearing the, uh, what we used to call the, the blue bunny suit, uh, the heated suit that we used to wear was a light blue. And I see it's the, the blue bunny suit. I'm yelling, hey, American, I'm an American also. And uh, the guy comes running over to me when he hits the ground, and uh, not only was the suit blue, but his face was blue. And uh, when I realized that it was my radio operator, Scott, see, he got out about four or five thousand feet, something around there, and so it took longer for him to come down. I was already on the ground for quite a little while, until he floated down. I did, had not put to it that he was part of my crowd. I thought it was from another mm -hmm. plane. And I remember saying, Scotty, because his face was all blue. And he came over to me, and then a German from the small town nearby would have pointed a gun at us and came over, and the peasants around there, they wanted my shoot. Because that was nylon, and that was a lot of dresses could be, <laughs> wedding gowns could be made out of that, and that was a very precious thing. Uh, Scott stayed by me and protected me a little bit, especially when they uh, 
official came on a horseback and almost raised his horse up and almost hit me with the horse and Scott got in front of me and where he got the nerve, I don't know, but he did. Uh, he did do something heroic later on, which I will relate, which is, I think, very important. I tried to get him a medal years later and I failed. I even had Jerry Solomon try and help me, but they turned us down because it was too late, they said. But I hear of people getting them now, years later. And he really deserves something because I've recovered from it. Never, you never recover 100%. But I went on and had a wonderful life. He hasn't, he's still living in the war. Anyway, we were taken to an airfield, separated. Uh, I was scared. When I hit the ground, I had a uh, Star of David that I wore around my neck. I pulled that and I threw it away into the field. Somewhere in Romania, on farmland, there's a Star of David. <laughs> anyway, and of uh, course, I was, you know, I'm Jewish and uh, Nazi Germany and and uh, the doctor that set my leg in a splint before they took me to the hospital at the Air Force uh, said very disdainfully, Romania is a very anti-Semitic country in those days. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, it most likely the same way today. And uh, he said Jewif, which is the French for Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I remember yelling back, my high school French. American OC also. Uh, French came in handy for me because the, the Romanians, the people, <coughs> the Romanian language was the peasant's language. The doctors, the nurses, the uh, officers all spoke French. It was considered beneath them to speak Romanian. They spoke French. So the little high school French that I had, I had three years, uh, helped me, put me in good, I was able to communicate a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, they took me to a civilian hospital because Bucharest was on fire from the bombs that we had dropped and they couldn't take me there. That's where the other American POWs were. And they put me in a civilian hospital and they put me in a ward where there was about eight, nine patients on this side and eight, nine patients on the other side and I was in the middle. And they drilled a hole through my heel and my foot and put a weights on it to stretch it out because my leg was all smashed. That was uh, a couple hours later they brought in a guy. He was the, he could play the part for the beer wagon driver, you know, and back in the 1880s, 1890s, big robust face with a big handlebar mustache with a barrel chest and they're putting him into the bed and they Nurse tells me, your, my bombs injured him. And they most likely told him that my bombs had injured him because he's yelling at me, Favain, Favain, Favain. And I'm worried before that and then Favain. And I don't know, and I think it's the Romanian F word. Well, it turned out that he had a brother who lived in Fort Wayne. and. In Europe, like uh, in Poland, Warsaw is Varsovia. Mm -hmm. uh, when immigrants came to the United States from Europe uh, back in the 1880s, 1890s, 19, early 1900s, they said they were going to New York, not New York, because the W in Europe mm -hmm. is like a, a V. Mm -hmm. It's not Warsaw, it's Warsaw, Varsovia actually. And uh, he, therefore, was for vain. He was trying to say Fort Wayne. I didn't know his brother. <laughs> and then he gave me a big smile, so I felt better. Uh, it wasn't bad there. Uh, one of the patients, of course, we know the man, his niece would come and she would... Uh, I found out later on that her husband was in the underground to overthrow Antonescu, who was the uh, fascist leader of Romania at the time and the uh, body of Adolf Hitler. He was as, almost as bad as Hitler. And uh, she would bring me extra food and things like that. I also had another plus. They had Russian prisoners in the kitchen working, paratroopers. 
girl paratroopers. And they would come to visit me. They, they were big. I'm talking about girls that weighed like 170, 180 pounds, five foot eight, five foot ten, all shaved heads. The ha hair was all shaved off because if they try to escape, they could be easily captured mm -hmm. with the shaved heads. And they would uh, bring me some extra food too. So that wasn't bad, but that was short lived. And uh, they sent me to a Russian prison camp. And when they got me to the Russian prison camp, they realized they wouldn't put me in with the Russians because the Russians were enlisted men and I was an officer. And Romania being an officer is a very important thing. It was the second and third sons of the nobility who did not get the title and the lands. And they would go into the military. In Romania, when an officer in those days, not today, when an officer walked down the street, the civilians had to salute him. And that would be like a breach of their, their faith to put an officer, even if he was an enemy officer, in with the enlisted men. So they put me in with another Romanian officer in the hospital of the camp that was right next to the uh, Russian prison camp, which was pretty good. And the officer next to me treated me with uh, respect and friendly. Until one day, I was there, about the third day I was there, fourth day, I'm not sure exactly. The, the Romanian doctor there tried to cripple me. Uh, he said my cast was a walking cast and it wasn't. And what I had was space between my two, my tibia and the fibula. Were both space, eventually in the States they had to give me a bone graft. And what happened was he had me walking on it and it, I would have been like two and a half, three inches short of my leg. I would have been badly crippled for life. It was a, uh, like an intern, a young doctor there who could speak any English, made me understand not to walk on it, but it was too late, the damage had been done. That doctor used to come in every morning and he would say, Chief Foch Gangster, uh, how are you gangster? Uh, pourquoi, uh, Americans, mitrailler les enfants and children, uh, les enfants, children, uh, feminine, les enfants. Uh, why does the American planes machine gun women and children and trains? Well, there might be women and children in the trains, but in the back of the trains was troops and uh, ammunition. They would do that, the Germans. They'd have front of the train with women and children, the back of the train with, uh, or vice versa. Uh, I couldn't answer them, there was nothing I could say. Anyway, one day, I was there about three or four days, and the nun brought in a picture of Jesus Christ and hung it on the wall. And at this point, I already knew that my Romanian officer was anti-Semitic. Because when I jumped out of the plane, I had a picture of my mother and father that I kept there, and I grabbed them put them into my pocket, they all, they broke. And I still have the Romanian tape on them with they're taped together and uh, stuff it in my pocket. And I showed him a picture of my father. My father was wearing a Shriners pin. Shriners is part of masonry. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to know what the pin was. So I said Shriners, but in Europe they don't know Shriners. I said, it's part of Masons. Oh, Masons, no good. Jews are in the Masons. So I knew right away I had a problem. <laughs> when they brought the picture and they hung it on the wall, he kept saying to me, Papa Roma, Pope Rome, and I kept ignoring him and he kept asking me, finally I yelled out, Jewish. He never spoke to me again. A day and a half later I was, and which wasn't too bad for me, I was moved to Bucharest with the American prisons because being with your own fellows is mm -hmm. nothing like it. Even if the conditions are terrible, the dysentery, lack of food, one bedpan, for, I don't know how many bed patients, there were 60 patients in my ward. And uh, I'd say half of them were bed patients. And when you have dysentery, bed patient gets, uh, bed pain gets a lot of use. Yeah. I have a letter home from the guy next to me, he's dead now, Delbert Newton from Jefferson City, Missouri. He had to cut my shorts off one day because I couldn't get the bed pain in time. Dysentery, it's, you have no control. Mm -hmm. But you were with your own, and that was very important. Uh, lice, Romanian word for lice is paduki, 
And when you have a test and the lice gets in the test, can't reach it. You have a wire trying to get down there with a swab of alcohol. If it hits where they've eaten already, it burns like hell. Uh, then Russians were coming in. And the Russians came in. Oh, by the way, you ever know what bittersweet is? Bittersweet is when you're a prisoner and in the daytime the Americans come over and bomb and at night the British come and bomb. The Americans wasn't bad because they would pick a target in daylight and we had what we called precision bombing. The British would bomb at night. They'd send a ship in what they called a pathfinder, They'd drop flares and then they would drop a flare where the target would be and then you would blanket bomb the rest of the uh, squadron uh, come in blanket bomb. Uh, if the Americans wanted to hit a building like this building, we would try to hit the building. There would be collateral damage within a block or two or three away. The British would bomb the 20 block area so that if we knock out the whole 20 blocks we know we got the target. And that was a little scary. And the bittersweet is you want to curse them because they're dropping bombs on you, but they're your own people and your allies, and they're going to help you get free someday because of that. So it's a bittersweet type of thing. You're scared stiff. You're cheering them on, but you wish it was over. <laughs> it's hard to put into words. Uh, the Russians are coming in. Romania overthrows Antonescu. Well, he was on the way out anyway because they were losing the war. And Romania capitulates and goes over to the Allies. Uh, they were always trying to pick the side that they would look like Hitler was going to be the winner, so they were with Hitler. When Hitler was going to be the loser, so they became with the Americans. It's something they would prostitute themselves very easily. And uh, all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, we hear rumblings. They put, Romanians put tanks around the hospital where we were. Downstairs was the, was the uh, non-commissioned officers who were not hurt. They had a, uh, a prison compound there. The officers were about five, six blocks away in a uh, converted school that was made into a prison camp for them. They wouldn't put the officers and the enlisted men together. That would be against their not religion, but the protocol as far as an officer is an officer and enlisted man is an enlisted man. And uh, Romania was trying to protect. We were an asset to the Romanians now when they want to be part of the Allies after they didn't work with Hitler. I'll take a little of that water if, you, if I may. Is that right here? Yeah, thank you. We knew that the Russians were coming in. We had excellent, uh, we had a radio in the uh, schoolhouse. The radio was a very good radio, a short, uh, short wave radio that we picked up. We knew that when Hitler was uh, bombed at, uh, by his own people at that time, we knew it before the, even the Germans or anybody knew it. Uh, the way we got the radio was we would while I was there, I didn't get too many radios. I got one after we were freed when the Russians came in, Red Cross packages. And in the Red Cross packages were American cigarettes, which you didn't smoke. Mm -hmm. You sold them. Uh, you see one of these packs, you could sell them, and you'd have like 20, 30 Romanian packs for it, because that was considered a luxury. And. Uh, they would collect the cigarettes. Also, our GI watches were very valuable when I sold mine. And we were able to get the short wave, so we had it hidden and we knew exactly what was going on in the war. We even had a meeting before the Russians came in. What we would do would we go out as a group and try and get to. We didn't want to go to Russia. You couldn't 
you, if, if you were on a mission and you could make Russia in uh, three quarters of an hour or take a trip to elsewhere, to Turkey, longer maybe, you went to Turkey. If A lot of American pilots uh, who flew to Russia and the whole crew never were heard of again. Uh, it's something that was never really brought out too much. But when we were briefed, we were told not to go into Russia. Soviet Union was in those days. Uh, Bulgaria wasn't too good either. They mistreated our POWs terribly. All of a sudden, that morning, and we were elated. The Russians came in, we're going to be free, we'll be going home. We're being protected that the Germans, Germans always try to take their prisoners back with them. They would never like to give up prisoners. But the Romanians put tanks around us and protected us. And all of a sudden, there's planes in the sky. It was like 7.38 in the morning. And all of a sudden, the bombs started to fall. And I mean bombing. They, the Germans terror bombed Bucharest three days and three nights, almost continuously around the clock. And uh, according to what I heard, they did more damage in those three days than we did in the whole war. We picked the target. Uh, we tried to not hit the towns if we could, although we did, I'm ashamed to say, if you can't hit the target, hit the town. That was orders. So, but it was war, and uh, in war you do terrible things. Uh, and the bombs are starting to fall, and I was lucky, I had the crutches, and there was one pair of crutches in the uh, ward, and uh, I had them. And, and I wanted to get out of the building to safety, and uh, I'd never walked steps with crutches, and all of a sudden I got a big long flight of stairs, it was an old hospital, and, Bucharest. So I slid the crutches down and I went down on my rear end, step by step. We got into the basement, there was about 20 or 25 of us there. Those who were a little more ambulatory was able to get away to safer places. The basement was not a basement, it was a cellar from an old, old building. And we were there that afternoon, that evening, and the Rats were scurrying around every time the bombs came close and came very close on a number of occasions. And in the morning we decided that it wasn't safe, we had to get out of there. We got out and we, on the grounds of the hospital there was a, uh, an air raid shelter, it was called an adipost. It was earth dug out of the ground and then mounted over the top of the, uh, some wire and mesh and concrete and things to protect you. And we were in about four or five feet below the earth. And there was about eight or nine of us, and during the course of the day, guys were leaving for safer places. Where I ended up, I was the last one there. And I came out, and the whole area around me was debris, brick, glass, just broken building. They had bombed the hospital we were in. Funny part about it was, they thought they were bombing us, but the Romanians put German prisoners in there, so they bombed their own people. And I'm trying to walk on the crutches and I'm about to fall flat on my face because I was very weak and I had lost a lot of weight. And uh, I'm going face down when two guys grab me and one is my radio operator. And he had come with five other fellows to look for Americans. He was looking for me. They're, they were all looking for their buddies that were there. A crew. It's a family. You bond. I'm going to take care of you. You're going to take care of me. We are a family. And Scotty, he came looking for me. They caught me before I went down. They got a door that had been blown off, they used it as a stretcher, and they took me up a few blocks away to a building, and I remember the name of the building, Franco-American Oil Company. It was never finished, the building, but the important part of it, it was the steel and the concrete was up. They never made the office and things like that, because World War II had started. 
It was the tallest building in Bucharest at the time. It was 16 stories high. Uh, unbeknown to me, our officers, the higher echelon officers, are, we had a few colonels there, full colonels. Uh, I made arrangements with the Romanian government. They borrowed $75,000, which was a lot of money in those days. We took over the eighth floor of that building. That was the safest spot in the building. You have the eight floors above you and you have far enough from the ground if it hits the ground. There were two 40 millimeter twin bofers on the roof too for, for anti-aircraft, so that was a deterrent to the Germans. They, bought, they set up a whole camp in that floor. We had armed guards. They got rifles from the Romanians. We had armed guards around us if anybody tried to come in, fascist and that type. And uh, that's where Scott and the two of them carried me uh, to the safety of that building. And when I came in there, it was a whole setup. Uh, you've got to give the American voice. Uh, we were there, we had, we bought food, we had a kitchen set up, guys were, were a little helpful at that, started to cook for ourselves. We had food, we had the safety, and in that period we were there for about, I'd say five or six days, you know, you lose track of what, actually what it is. Uh, a Romanian pilot who was in Romania, there was a princess by the name of Princess Marie. King Carol had been kicked out of office when he was, when Antonescu came in, when the fascists came in during the time of Hitler. And she was from the royal family. She was 100% pro-American. She hid American airmen. She would hit them in, in uh, monasteries and nunneries, you know, and things like that. She saved a lot of American lives. Matter of fact, the uh, POWs from Romania adopted her, and she died about seven, eight years ago, was it? About six, seven years ago. And we took care of her for the rest of her life. Yeah, we supported her. Uh, her nephew was a fighter pilot in the Romanian Air Force. Uh, he must have been the second or third son of the nobility and didn't get the lands. And uh, he flew an American colonel to Italy to apprise them of what was going on. I remember a commission came in to evaluate the situation. There's one scene before I go on to the rescue out that I think is very important that has had a very... I flew 26 missions. Time, am I going too long? No, no. I flew 26 missions and I dropped a lot of bombs on a lot of towns and a lot of targets and I most likely killed people. When you're up at 20, 25,000 feet, you don't see people. All you see is topography. You'll see the things that will stand out would be a soccer field will stand out, a racetrack, uh, a uh, Railroad marshalling yards, which was a target very often, trying to disrupt shipping, troops, and ammunition. Oil fields is very simple, that you can tell, no problem. <coughs> and it's all quiet. The bombs, you see the black smoke and the puffs coming up, you don't hear it. When you're on the ground, it's a completely different story. Everything shakes, you feel it, you hear it, you scares the living daylight out of you and you see people dying. On the ground you don't see people, I mean when you're up in the air. In the three days of the terror bombing that Germany did day and night, one sight stands out of my memory that I'll never forget. As I mentioned earlier, we were on the eighth floor. The building was built with a courtyard in the middle of the building, like the Pentagon building has a courtyard. By the way, I worked on the Pentagon building as a laborer. When my parents wouldn't sign for me to go in, I went there and worked as a laborer. I wanted to be part of the war effort. Almost got killed there, too. <laughs> uh, I'm 
watching the people. And there were, in that building, there were over 10,000 civilians, maybe more. Uh, it was the safest place in Bucharest to go. The only problem they had is they were there for three days and they hadn't had any food. On the third day, they brought tr trucks in with bread, bread trucks. And the people in the building started to queue up in the courtyard to get the bread. And all of a sudden, the sirens went off again and you could hear the planes in the air. And I watched from the eighth floor as these people scurried back and forth to the safety of the building to the bread trucks. They were torn between mm -hmm. hunger and safety. And they were, it, was the, it was like mice scurrying back and forth. It was a terrible sight to see. And uh, I broke down. And I said I'd never bomb again. Uh, after that, later on, I said I would if, they, if it meant to save, you know, mm -hmm. you might see people, you might kill some, but you're saving thousands. Millions, maybe, you know, overall, I'm not talking me individually as a group. Uh, but watching these people scurrying back, the, the bread they needed, and yet they were the fearful of the bombing, they were running to the scurry, that, that had a terrible, devastating effect. I'd have dreams of it and that type of a thing. Anyway, to go on, this commission, this nephew of Princess Marie and this American colonel flew out in an ME-109 and luckily they made it to Italy. They had taken out all the radio compartments so that the colonel, our colonel, could be stuffed in there. Mm -hmm. And they set up a commission to fly us out. It was the first and largest evacuation of American prisoners of war from enemy territory ever accomplished. During the course of the bombing of Ploesti, uh, the first one was a devastating raid from North Africa. Uh, it continued on until uh, 1944, the end of August. Uh, 3,000 men were shot down over Romania. Uh, 1,100 were prisoners. So we lost 1,900 died there, 1,100 were flown out. They put together a rescue thing where they outfitted the B-17s, a few of them with Stretches in the Bombay, I was in one of those, I was a stretcher case. And uh, they had fighters around, the whole 15th Air Force uh, was involved in this. And they, we had fighter cover the whole time, they would land, load up. It was a two day operation and they got 1,100 of us out. As a matter of fact, the History Channel had it. As a matter of fact, I, it shows me being taken off in a stretcher. Oh, the war was still, this was, this was in the beginning of September of 44. You figure it out. Mm -hmm. We didn't even have, uh, just right after D-Day, the uh, Battle of the Bulge hadn't come about yet, and the war didn't end until, what, April of 45. And they got us back to Barry, Italy, waiting for us there at the airport was uh, Major General Nathan Twining. Uh, he greeted me when I got off the plane. And also we all got a letter of commendation from him for the work we had done. Uh, our group on June 26, two days before we got shut down, was, uh, I was the, uh, now I'm bragging. Uh, it was a mission to Vienna. Uh, and uh, it was a very well done mission. We hit the target very well. I was on the planning team of that mission. I did the briefing on the bombardiering part of it. You have a weatherman deals with the weather. You have somebody to tell you what type of enemy opposition you'll have. And uh, my job was to do the initial point of the, how to come in on the bomb run and that type of thing, what wind you would have and those type of things. So you would know how to adjust for it. The, uh, so I'm proud of that. Uh, the, the rescue mission was uh, really a thing that was never done before, to get 1,100 men out of enemy territory. Uh, we were flown to Barry, Italy, and then we were flown to, well, I had a bad time in Barry. Uh, on the second day I'm in Barry, uh, a kid from the neighborhood 
the, he was a couple of years younger than me, so he wasn't. In those days, your friends were more or less the same age. Uh, comes in to see me. I says, how'd you know I was here? He says, well, my, my parents write to me and I've been in touch and talking to your parents. I said, well, how's my mother and father? He says, well, don't you know your mother's dead? I broke down. My mother died from the telegram that I was missing in action. Uh, I tried to avoid that because I had sent it to my father, his place of business in, New York, in Manhattan instead of having it sent to Brooklyn. But somebody who meant well, it was over the July 4th weekend, my father's business was closed for the weekend and they tracked down where the home address was so they sent it on Monday morning after the July 4th weekend. And my mother got the telegram, which I didn't want. I wanted my father to get it to try and prepare her. She had very high blood pressure and she had cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, I was in no condition to take that. Uh, even the telegram I sent home was that I know about mother, K-N-O-W, and it came about now about mother, N-O-W. So they weren't sure how about mother. Or or what? Uh, then we were ZI'd out of Naples, a 17th general in Naples, on a uh, USS refuge. And we came back on a hospital ship. You'd be lit up with all your lights on and all the Red Cross is showing. Uh, it hit Staten Island in October. And uh, I uh, was able to see my family. Uh, I liked Staten Island, it was right close to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, I get notification that I'm being shipped to Butler, Pennsylvania. So I missed the shipment, purposely. And I got away with it. But they sent me with my own papers. And I took two GIs that had also missed the shipment because they didn't want to go either. But we took a delay in route in Pittsburgh. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time in hospitals, uh, army hospitals and then VA hospitals for many years. Uh, Post-traumatic war syndrome, my leg was bad, finger. And uh, for a long time I didn't get over it too well. Finally I did, I was able to accept things and make the changes necessary. I had a good wife. When did you get married? We got married November the 25th, Thanksgiving, 1948. We will be married 54 years this Thanksgiving. And uh, it's been a blessing. I was able to put the war behind me. You have to. My, as I told you earlier, my radio operator never did. And he's, he lives it every day. And it's a terrible thing. He's disabled completely. Uh, I got over it. I have, have a wonderful family, three children, uh, grandchildren. Uh, was able to do what I wanted to do and be successful at it. And Did you use the GI Bill? No. No, I didn't. I was, well, I was in and out of hospitals all the time. It was almost mm -hmm. impossible to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I regret that I didn't go to college, mm -hmm. but I did go to a lot of seminars and I went to Tulane and NYU and a lot of others. He's, and I think that's the whole story, unless you have some questions you want to um, ask. Him. How do you think your experience affected or changed your life? Well, it changed my life completely. It, uh, I have no idea, but there is no such thing as a change of life. Mm -hmm. Whatever happens in life, you have to then react to it. Mm -hmm. I don't know of anybody that can just lay out a a, a life plan. You can have a plan, yes. but you better be in position to make changes. Uh, my life has been great. I lived, seven men didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, even the times of pain or suffering or turmoil till I finally straightened my life around, be able to cope with things. Uh, was part of life. Uh, you have to accept the good with the bad and you have to try and make it as good as you possibly can and I have no complaints. 
and the time I spent in the service and what I went through and whatever it was, good or bad, everybody is affected differently. Mm -hmm. It was all part of life and I've accepted and I'm happy to, uh, that it turned out the way it did. Uh, I don't know, I was on crutches when I met her. Maybe I wouldn't have met her if I was not crutches. Uh, there are all these good things that come about. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to accept the good with the bad and you have to I live by one thing. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And since I've latched on to that, it has helped me tremendously. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be 80. Yes.